Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another installment of TED Excellence, the show in which space is space and space ace is an ace. I don't know what I'm doing here. And I come to you live from Crater Valley on the moon. Dog, cat, fox, a pepper jack, and all of you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Thursday, Terrestrial Thursday. Yes, we return once again to the off-brand TED Talk world of TEDx for fun and excitement. Uh, a couple of notes first before I get into the hellos, because they are important. First and foremost, you may notice at the top of the corner of the screen here, a misspelling of the word spatial. Well, I just want to assure that is not my doing. That is the title as given to us by the TEDx YouTube page for this presentation. And uh, I found it only fitting to memorialize their title as provided. Now, was that a mistake on their part? Was that intentional on their part? I don't know. Uh, if it's corrected in the future, so be it. But I just wanted to at least let everyone know, I know how to spell spatial. So maybe this is, I, I, I don't know. Or maybe it's a misspelling of special. I have no idea. Either way, it's part of the reason why I was curious about this presentation. Uh, the second thing to note is that the bingo cards have been updated. Yes, something has changed about the bingo cards. I've uh, alluded to it in several episodes prior to this. You may notice it, uh, but even if you don't, I will be going over the bingo card at some point in the near future, so uh, prepare for that. By the way, it's bingo card A tonight. A as in astronomy, because it's all about space tonight, I guess, maybe sort of. We'll find out together. Anyway, who's joining me on this adventure into theories of space? Noah Asensio, hello. Tony Giff, hello. Kieverdam, hello. Advocatus Diaboli, hello. Shell D, hello. Uh, let's see who else here. D Derek LaRue, oh my God, Derek LaRue. Of course it's Derek LaRue. Derek LaRue, thank you so much, as always, for your continued generosity and support. Hope you're having a good Thursday. Hope you enjoy the show. Thank you again. Uh, who else is here? Shadow Claw. Hello. Grand Inquisitor Tier Alexander. Hello. The original Shroom. Hello. Speaking of which, the original Shroom. How about that? Okay. Uh, let's see who else is here. Roger Reynolds. Hello. Ryan R. Hello. Simon Willikins. Hello. Data Wasteland. Hello. Keldrig. Hello. Super Mutant 2099. Hello. Angelverse. Hello. Ercole Di Stefano. Hello. Jamie Melquist. Hello. And I think that's everyone I see. Uh, hopefully it is. If I've uh, missed you, if you're lurking, if you're in the future, uh, hello. And I think John Miller, if I'm not mistaken, some somebody said in the uh, Discord that they would not be able to make it tonight. So let me make sure I say hello there. Uh, yes, John Miller, unfortunately, was not able to make it tonight to attend live. So uh, hopefully he will see this in the future. And uh, thank you, Kieverdam. Let me bring this up. Come on, StreamYard, you can do it. Uh, security is being let go next week. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, then... Wait, are you security? Uh, are, are you protected by security? Yeesh. Well, either way, that's terrible. I'm sorry, Kieverdam. Uh, thank you for the, uh, super chat. That's grim. Eh, I don't know what to say. No, you're not security. Okay, well, that's that's good. I mean, I'm glad that you still have your job, but if security's being let go, then who's who's watching things? Does that now fall on your shoulders? I don't know. Speaking of Kieverdam, as always, she has helpfully provided the fundraiser links to the top of the chat box. Up there, you'll find links to our friends Joshua, Maddie, and uh, Lisa. Uh, Joshua needs some help uh, covering some garnishment of wages over some crazy financial things that befell him. Maddie needs some help in paying off the deductibles for cancer treatment. So please take a look at that one for sure. And lastly, Lisa and her boyfriend are trying to pay for medical bills for their, their pupper. So uh, take a look at those. If you can donate, please do. If you can't, that's fine. But if you can share those out on social media, that would be appreciated. Uh, all right. Well, all that being said, yes, tonight, a, a phrase I've never heard of before, but does sound similar to things I have. 
critical spatial theory or critical special theory. I'm not quite sure if that was a misspelling one way or the other. Either way, if it's spatial, it occurs to me that several years ago now, a long, long time ago, I did a couple of videos on something called spatial justice. Now, spatial justice uh, took many forms. Um, it's hard to define because even the people I remember looking at had a hard time defining it. But one example I was given in the course of these presentations that I looked at was uh, someone planning out a park and planting uh, flowers that might ward off people with allergies. So you don't do that. Don't plant flowers in a park because that would be unjust to the allergy ridden. I'm not making that, that is, that was one of the examples I was given in a spatial justice argument. The other thing it reminds me of is critical race theory or anything that has critical in front of it these days. So I don't know where we're going with it. However, I do know one thing. The presenter is a celebrity. Uh, you may not know the name Harry Lennox but you may recognize the face and certainly the voice. Uh, I remember first finding Harry Lennox uh, in the Julie Taymor version of Titus Andronicus starring Anthony Hopkins way back in the, what, late 90s, early aughts. Uh, excellent production, excellent movie. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. Uh, first time I saw Harry Lennox, man, his delivery of Shakespeare, ooh, so good, that voice, ooh, so good. Um, and you will have recognized him probably from many TV and movie roles since then, particularly, I think most recently, The Blacklist, where he plays the uh, the super FBI in charge guy. I forget the name of the character off the top of my head. But either way, it's a celebrity. So that adds some kind of gravitas to it, I suppose. But yes, critical spatial theory, revitalizing cultural infrastructure. So are we talking about like urban renewal or architecture or... Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But I guess my big question is, given the uh, formation of the phrase, one, is it a new phrase? Because I've never heard of it before. And I don't know if it's our speaker's invention, which will cover a square on the board, or if it's something that's been pre-established. And two, given the sort of uh, uh, semantic roots of that phrase, critical theory, is race involved? I suppose we'll find out. Anyway, that's all the preamble. Let's get started again. Bingo card A. Links are in the description. The bingo cards have been updated. You may notice the difference. We'll get to it momentarily. I'll start off with a few seconds for a sound test. You guys tell me if you can hear it, and then we will proceed. Okay, you hear all the cheering and the clapping and all that good stuff. Let me know in the chat real quick, and then we will go on. Uh, WTF is even a cultural infrastructure. Um, I mean, I, I could see something like a culturally significant city or like, like, okay, just as the easiest example, Washington, DC, right. And with all the monuments and the, uh, historic buildings that serve the government and all that kind of thing, you could call that cultural infrastructure. If, if I had to, if I had to hazard a guess, I could see something like that, you know, or a, uh, uh, a recognized historic site in a city or something. You know, I, I, I could see that, but I don't know what, what our speaker will say. Uh, Derek LaRue says, sounds good. Five by five says JMK. Uh, Super Mutant 2099 gives me a thumbs up. You're a ridiculous lunatic. Hello. And uh, anybody else I get? Oh, also, of course, JMK. Uh, okay, let's go. Today. Whoa, whoa. Oh, that was a recording? That clapping stopped really quick. Today. Yes. I want to talk about the gift of American performance art. Oh, okay, sure. And the black Americans who invented it from whole cloth. Oh, performance art in America was invented. Okay. Knitting it together from the threads of forced labor, a dramatic desperation for freedom, sacred literature, deeply ingrained rhythms and received harmonies. Uh, Simon Willick, yes, Harold Cooper, that's the name of the character in The Blacklist. Okay, so performance art in America 
came from one race. Uh, okay. This gift has both been the result and the means of surviving an experience in America that would have crushed a merely human people. A merely human people. So you're more human than human? Q Rob Zombie. Without a fortress to protect this gift, uh -huh. these uniquely American art forms and the heretofore indomitable spirit of its creators could soon be erased. For the past several years, I have worked to create a suitable home for this contribution. Okay, so like a museum or a theater or a combination thereof? My efforts have helped me to identify an idea that I call critical spatial theory. Ah, an idea I like to call. All right, well, in the absence of any more clarification, we're going to call that a new buzzword or buzz phrase. Let's go to the bingo card and remind ourselves what we're listening for. Collectivizes own demographic. Yes. Uh, just did at the beginning. Systemic institutional. Not yet, but I'd be surprised if not. Sales pitch for product or service. It's possible. It seems like he's about to pitch something, some project he's working on. Childhood or family anecdote? Not yet. Diversity, equity, and or inclusion? Not yet. Plays victim? Not yet. We'll see. Uh, microaggressions or unconscious bias? No. Privilege? Perhaps contradicts own point or argument? Not sure what the argument is yet. Patriarchy? Weightless example? Economic disparity? Yes, economic disparity. No longer wage gap. I have instead revised it to economic disparity to cover a broader range of similar type things. So there you go, economic disparity, unless or until we decide to change it to something else. Free space, feminism, marginalized or marginalization, a list, white supremacy, which I think is probably either inherent or implied, depending on where we go with this, word salad, self-vilification or wretchedness, argumentative non sequitur, and then attempt to coin new buzzword or buzz phrase, circle in that one, mind reading or assumes motives, benevolent condescension, anecdote that probably never happened, and lastly, leaves out vital context. So, so far on the board, we have collectivize his own demographic, free space, and attempt to coin new buzzword or buzz phrase. Let's continue. Or the intersection of art and architecture. The intersection of art and art. Well, I love intersectionality. The intersection of art and art. Isn't architecture an art in and of itself? Or, or can be? Okay. Which encourages active participation in shaping the spaces of our everyday lives. I, I have done a, a few uh, videos before on uh, the, the justice of spaces. So that's not unfamiliar to me. This theory explains the conditions that we observe every day, okay. offers a practical solution with provable results, and can withstand the examination of any standard form. Really? All right. So it's it's also it's it's a method, it's a solution, has evidence, and can stand up to scrutiny. Okay, I I can't wait. The basic premise uh -huh. is that when well designed and well used, space is the framework of our reality. Space is the framework of our reality. Uh, yes. It is the scaffolding on, on which the dreams of a people are built. Mm -hmm. Well conceived and well executed. Mm -hmm. The development of a designated space can absolutely change our neighborhoods and maybe even save lives. Uh, I, I guess it's... Anything is possible. What are you talking about? We're talking about a sanctuary, in effect, a, a tangible environment for achieving more humane outcomes. A tangible environment for achieving more humane outcomes as compared to... When I was a young boy, I went to St. Bride Elementary School and... Ah, childhood or family anecdote circling that one. So when you were a young boy, you were attending what's now? Young boy, I went to St. Bride Elementary School, and like my brother, I served as an altar boy in the parish church. Mm -hmm. Like my sister, I sang in the church choir. Uh -huh. I remember the feeling of reverence as I walked through the door into the nave, each step bringing me into a deeper experience of the mystery. 
Of course, being in Chicago, there were many Catholic churches. They were all over the place. Yeah, it's almost like they were sick with him or something. Uh, real quick, Keldrig, thank you so much. If his theory delivers what it promises, I'll be impressed. It'll be a first for this series. I, you know, I, I try to keep an open mind. I, I don't know. Uh, can the design of a space have an effect on those within it or even outside of it? I, yes. Yeah, you can use design, you can use shapes, you can use color and lighting and everything else to make a place feel inviting or make a place feel uh, abhorrent. Uh, this is why we have, you know, the spooky house at the end of the street, or we have the very, you know, prison-looking building down the road, which either might be a prison or an elementary school, depending on who you hired to design the thing. Uh, churches, you know, you have some classical designs that are still beautiful to this day. Uh, you have some art deco buildings that evoke a period of time and a style that uh, is kind of long ago and far away now. I, he doesn't have to push too hard on the door to convince me that you can invoke a feeling or, uh, you know, sort of impose a sensation uh, through space and architecture and design. That's, that's, that's self-evident, I think. Uh, but, all right, with, with that stipulated, though, where is he going specifically with this theory? Or is he just giving a name to something that is, again, fairly common knowledge? The word Catholic means universal in every place. It does? I, I don't know. Is, is that true? I, I, I guess I've never thought, what is the definition of the word Catholic? But if I were to ask you here today where the Catholic Church lives, uh -huh. what it calls home base, mm -hmm. you would most likely answer St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, the world's smallest country. Uh, I suppose that's Mother Church, right? Uh, Advocates Diaboli says, yes, it does. Yep, Catholic means universal. Yes, is Austin. Okay, I, I did not know. Now I know. And knowing uh, is a constant source of disappointment, but also half the battle. Tradition holds that the great basilica was built over the bones of St. Peter, who mm -hmm. was martyred on the site. Yes. In Mecca, you can go to the very center of Islam. Indeed, if you are a Muslim with the means and the physical condition, it is compulsory that you make the pilgrimage at least once in your lifetime. Yes. The Temple Mount notwithstanding, the very heart of the faith is the Kaaba. The, black the Temple Mount notwithstanding? Uh, I mean, if you say so. <laughs> black stone occupies a position in space around which there is an undeniable significance. It is the focal point for over a billion people in prayer and worship. Yes. Likewise, if you wanted to visit the seat of the American experiment of democracy itself, you would go to the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Yeah. This spring, my wife and I visited the National Theater in London. It is a triumphant space with stages named after Gilgood and Olivier. Again, if you want to convince me that there are locations, uh, structures, buildings, so on and so forth that have cultural significance and can have a profound effect on those that... Uh, impart some kind of sentiment or meaning onto them for some reason or another, or represent something larger than simply the stones in which they are built upon. You, you, you've got me, you know, you, you've got me. It is a, a crowning achievement of architecture and theatrical content, but also a public space with open uh -huh. internet access, uh -huh. a bookstore, wow. a museum, a bar, wow. a gift shop. We can tell you that the home of William Shakespeare Stratford-upon-Avon. That mm -hmm. is where the culture of Shakespeare lives. Uh, again, sentimentally, yes. But where does black performance culture live? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. Are, are you going to build it? What is the focal point of the outpourings of the heart that live in our dance, our song, our, our passion, our wisdom. I, I, I don't know. Where? Where is its home? What city? What's in the home? Who designed it? Where can we learn more about these things? Um, 
Let's see. Let me think for a second. I gotta, I gotta re re refresh my my memory on something real quick. Make sure I'm not completely misremembering a name here. Uh, I'm not. Okay. How about how about the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater? How about the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater? It's one of those things where, like, I remember a name, and I just want to make sure I'm not mixing things up, because it's been a long time since I've had to invoke that name, but suddenly it came to my mind. Black performance art. Alvin Ailey. He's got a theater after him. How about that? Imagine a living museum where history comes alive through the miracle of modern technology, where the next Ella Fitzgerald, who's in third grade right now, gets to sing with a vintage Duke Ellington orchestra. Uh, why must it be segregated again in the modern day? Well, the next great playwright like August Wilson or Lynn Nottage is discovered at Kenwood High School. Mm -hmm. She's trained and refined in an apprenticeship program, given a stage where she can express her gift. Uh, how about one where anybody could? But, okay, we gotta, we gotta winnow it down again? Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm getting close to circling sales pitch for product or service. I have a feeling he's either working on or trying to uh, uh, develop such a thing. Imagine a place where every week, every night, all day long, whatever the weather there happens to be doing, you can go down and catch a bolt of lightning. Mm -hmm. We know from experience that when form follows function, it can create a community that is the very purpose of its conception and creation. Mm -hmm. I would like to introduce the Bronzeville Renaissance Project. Okay, sales pitch for project or service. The Bronzeville Renaissance Project. Okay, circle in that one. I see this as a space that is the last and best chance of enshrining the vitality of the American soul. Uh, based on one particular element, it sounds like, unfortunately. The American soul. Okay. We're going to build this vision in Bronzeville. It's, it's called Bronzeville now, that part of the city that people on the south side refer to as the low end. Uh, if you say so. I've never been to Chicago. Many years ago, it was called the Black Belt. Ah. Black Americans fleeing the oppression of the south were crowded into a little strip of land about eight miles in length and just about two miles wide. Today, mm -hmm. it's recognized as the center of black American history in Chicago. But it won't surprise you that hurting humanity in this fashion resulted in unsanitary conditions, overcrowding, despair, and a people looking for any opportunity for hope. Okay, that sounds terrible. Uh, okay. And yet. And yet. It also cultivated among the residents a genius for life. Uh -huh. The genius of the American spirit, the genius of the human spirit, is that like a diamond formed from a lump of coal, intense pressure can create something precious and rare. Can also crush it to dust. Uh, I, I may have stolen that uh, follow-up from an episode of MacGyver. If you can remember that episode and what was going on at the time, you're old and you're a nerd. The elders of the black church used to refer to this as making a way out of no way. Okay. Miraculously, businesses and music flourished in Bronzeville. Mm -hmm. Barbershops and restaurants, publishers, doctors, lawyers grew prosperous despite years of government sanctioned redlining that choked off the capital that would have allowed the area to thrive. Even today, the neighborhood suffers from a lack of investment and disproportionate crime and mortality rates. And yet, disproportionate crime compared to i mean I, I don't know when when somebody starts talking about disproportionate crime anywhere within the boundaries of chicago and or illinois surrounding area i'm like well disproportionate to nearly every other place in the country but okay all right so there's a and this is all new history to me because i don't know anything about chicago okay so there's a place in chicago that has a very uh, dire history to it when it comes to uh, black Americans in this country and especially in Chicago. Okay. 
and it has been economically depressed. And I may I may circle uh, economic disparity here momentarily uh, for generations. All right. And so you're going to bring a, I guess, a performing arts center to this part of town explicitly for one race to show off and thrive. What, what what if, and I know, I know, heaven forfend, uh, what if it was a performing arts center that celebrated that style that was birthed in that part of town, uh, in that culture, but showcased anyone willing to take part in furthering that style or those performance arts or things like that? Is is that is that too pie in the sky? Is that too is that is that offensive somehow? I don't know. Uh, thank you for us the glass. This halftime show sucks. Yeah, uh, the Wrigleyville uh, TEDx series. I've done several TEDx's now that took place at Wrigleyville, um, and yeah, they just they just turned it into an occasional TEDx stage. So, you know, it's an interesting uh, interesting uh, place to do it. It gives it a bit of a uh, character and. And a background to it. So, you know, I kind of like it. It'd be kind of cool, I suppose. Anyway, uh, you were saying? The people who live here hold within them far more potential for dramatic and, and presentational expression and the space that it requires than currently exists. Mm -hmm. Harvesting this potential will allow our neighborhoods to transform. Okay, so only people that live in the area can attend this th i'm 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 not i'm not trying to be uh, a nitpicker here or anything i i'm really trying to understand exactly what how this program is supposed to work uh but as a, as an aside he obviously has an advantage through years of stage acting and and practice and everything else but i have to say uh, harry lennox might be one of the best presenters of a tedx simply on the basis of articulation uh word choice and just booming baritone. He, he really he really holds his own on this one as compared to 99% of TEDx talkers. Now, admittedly, not everybody's got his training or experience, but it still shines through. And enrich our souls. The French philosopher Henri Lefebvre refers to this type of critical environment as a social space. Uh -huh. In his book, The Production of Space, Lefebvre argues that a social space is the result of conceiving of a place, determining how and where to build it, the representational space, and the presentation within the space. Uh, yes, I agree. That sounds reasonable. The lived space. Mm -hmm. As an adjective, critical means expressing an adverse or negative judgment. Uh, I suppose it can. Or, see, I always thought of it as, and maybe I'm mistaken, uh, depending on the context, I always thought of something as more, you know, intentionally objection, uh, ob 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 objective. Sorry, my words lost me there for a second. Like trying to be objective about something, pragmatic, critical, not being wholly accepting. So I guess, yeah, well, maybe, maybe it kind of does fit. Okay. In literature, it implies an analysis of merit and fault. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of how I sort of see it usually. In the healthcare space, critical means dire, endangered. Yes. Touch and go. Yes. Well, these terms might well define the south side of the city. We are in a critical state with regard for our need to express mm. ourselves through a performance culture. Uh huh. To address this desert, we need a project that is planted in fertile ground. Uh huh. It has to have room to spring up in an ample space to flower. Mm -hmm. Ideally, this would happen in a place where there's a critical need for it. Okay, so you want to build a community performing arts center. Okay. I, 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 I have no opposition. I just am curious as to the, I guess, overall motivation or meaning of it as compared to the history that you've cited for wanting to put it there in the first place. A place where it had already thrived, where there are workers to till the soil, uh -huh. seeds to plant, 
and plenty of fertilizer. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. That oh man. Okay, I there, there's a joke there. I don't I don't need to work that hard to put it in there. But okay, you fertilizer for your okay. Well, if it sounds like I'm talking about a garden, it just so happens that the <sighs> motto of Chicago is herbs in horto. The the motto of Chicago is herbs in horto. I I, I got to tell you between the definition of Catholic, the Chicago motto. And the history of Bronzeville, I, I, I got to say, I'm learning quite a bit that I didn't know before I started this one. City in a garden. Uh-huh. My team of developers and designers have conceived mm. of our social space as this. Oh. We will be getting started in the next few months with the build out of phase one, the Lily and Marcy Center. Okay. Well, there you go. It's, yeah, it's a, it's actual planned out project. All right. So presumably he's got the land, he's got the permits, he's got the designs, he's going to do it. Uh, okay. And so this this TEDx talk is marketing, I guess? Phase two is the African American Museum for the Performing Arts and Artist Housing. Uh -huh. It has taken five years from the original concept to the build out of phase one. Wow. Critical time has passed. Mm -hmm. And yet I have determined that rather than to succumb to the profound frustration of worrying how to pay for this, whether or not we'll run out of time to center myself. And I have watched in amazement as time itself has helped us to expand and improve upon the vision. Uh, I don't know if I was developing a real estate project, even if it was one for, you know, community benefit or nonprofit, I'd probably still be worrying about the the funds to make it happen, but okay. Citizens of Bronzeville have themselves insisted that we think bigger. Mm. Critical spatial theory has the benefit of learning from those objects of our study, from what they got right and what might be improved upon. Critical spatial theory. I'm still waiting to hear what the application is and why it's different from just the idea that spaces can have an impact or that spaces can become a focus of social activity, gathering, meaning. Um, you know, uh, some places can become socially meaningful completely by accident and without any kind of architecture or design. You know, some place can become sentimental or uh, iconic for some reason uh, without too much effort just because it is. Uh, what was... Uh, Oh, uh, I, it, it was either in, I want to say it was either in San Francisco or Seattle, which makes a lot of sense. There was a wall that was just covered in gum. Like people had been sticking their gum on this wall in this alley or something for decades. And it was just a giant wall covered in a rainbow of gum pieces layer upon layer upon layer. If you, if you took a picture of it at the side, it kind of like bowed outward from this wall like it was pregnant or something. And then they had to scrape it all off because the acid in the gum, the sugar, the saliva, all the, everything, there's the compounded everything had started eating away at the stone foundation or something. <laughs> but people would go to this place just to put their gum on there for years and years and years. It wasn't intended, just kind of happened. So, yeah, no, I I believe in the idea of spaces or places or locations becoming meaningful or being designed that way. It's not, uh, again, not, not, a, not a difficult sell. I don't know that critical spatial theory makes a whole lot of sense unless you give it its own spin. But anyway, I thank you, Kiefer Dam. Gum one, gum all, pretty much. I remember seeing pictures of this thing. It looked disgusting, but people kept like putting stuff on there or, or taking pictures of them kissing it or something like, ew. Um, let's see. Uh, the chewing gum wall, is that Seattle or say, I, I don't know. That's why I can't remember. I can't remember if it's Seattle or, or San Francisco. <laughs> is it Seattle? Okay. Or it was Seattle. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I remember I saw a story where they were like, I'm going to scrape it all off and steam clean the whole thing. And I just kept thinking, how long until somebody either restarts it 
or starts a new one just like half a block down the road. Anyway. Our method is to create and complete a performing arts land development, which utilizes multiple disciplines, mm. including the disciplines of logistical interdependence. Logistical interdependence. Uh, that, that's another phrase I've never heard before. Logistical interdependence. Well, I mean, I guess, like, how does one make a Twinkie? You have to both source the sugar and the flour and the other components and, and like the, the, the bags for the plastic around it and, or the plastic for the bags around it. Uh, yeah, so in order to make a Twinkie, there is a logistical interdependence to make that happen. Is that what you mean? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm doing my, my spelling bee deconstruction deal here. And spatial planning. Spatial planning. The British town player Lewis Keeble defines as the art and science of the ordering of use of land and the siting of buildings and communication routes so as to secure the maximum practicable degree of economy, convenience, and beauty. Uh, okay. So a building plan, I guess. Our ambition is to manage as many of the support trays to our performing arts facilities as possible. A, a costume shop, a scene shop, a, 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 a dedicated museum, a performing arts center. Okay, so you want to have all of the resources you need to make the thing work on site. So, I mean, that that is a giant undertaking because you're effectively going to have to have uh, a handful of independently operating businesses effectively in one space, all focused on, you know, supporting one idea, which I, again, not impossible, but man, that's going to be complex. That's going to be, that's going to be rough. Um, yeah, I, I, the logistics, that's going to be something. We will populate these stages with resident dance and theater companies. Okay, so residents, so those within the surrounding community then. We will build the stages to host the finest music on offer, from classical to jazz to gospel and beyond. <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the implication of the introduction is not true and that it won't be restricted to people of a particular skin color to perform. It's going to be a performance center for lots of different people, right? We propose to partner with private ventures to build a jazz club, restaurants, mm -hmm. artist housing, a boutique hotel. Okay. Um. <clears throat> here's, here's just my thought, and I, I kind of already alluded to this. Um, there was a time where my company was getting ready to update our, our website and our product. And in the course of deciding what to add to our product, um, somebody suggested having or building into it a chat feature. As in anybody logged into our product could also chat with anybody else logged into our product because our product tends to be used in office spaces and with uh, mutual workers. I'm trying to be, keep as vague as possible here. Um, somebody in the course of that said, uh, we're, we're not a chat program company. Isn't that a bit outside of our wheelhouse? Shouldn't we focus on what we're, we're good at? Because we start spreading ourselves off into different areas. We start implementing different things that we're not really good at. We're going to have to support things that's not really our Ballywick and on and on and on. But, um, uh, but you know, uh, novelty and quote unquote innovation won the day. And for a time, uh, there was a chat program on our product. And of course, since everybody and their brother either had AOL or Gchat or a zillion other things that were much better at it and provided a lot more features and so on, nobody ever used it. So we ended up spending... I don't even know. I wasn't even part of the decision-making process on that. We spent it. 
many, many development hours and God knows how much money on adding a chat feature to our, our, our product that was absolutely useless and nobody used. And it was foreseeable that it was useless and nobody would use it, but, you know, uh, more industrious heads prevailed. You want to have a performance art center, a costume shop, uh, a boutique hotel. You want to have stages and... I, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe you're aiming a bit too high. You should focus on the core of the thing, you know, make sure that works first. And I realize you're talking about this in phases. Uh-huh. But it seems a bit, a bit much. Maybe I'm correct. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Parking. Our Parking. goal is to have a self sustainable land development infrastructure, the equivalent of Lincoln Center or Kennedy Center? Uh, I, it, is, it is an ambitious goal. I will give you that. I'm, I'm not sure it'll achieve that much uh, expanse. But also like Vatican City, oh. an independent state oh. for expanding the curative power of the performing arts. Okay, as again, as long as we're talking about the performing arts writ large and so on. Okay, but you want a museum, you want a performing arts center, you want a hotel, you want a costume, manufacturing, tailor shop, gift shop, restaurants. Okay. In his beautiful play, Gem of the Ocean, mm -hmm. August Wilson creates a character named Aunt Esther. She's a great matriarch. She claims to be 285 years old. Mm -hmm. And she lays out a vision to Citizen Barlow, a man looking for the reason to his existence. Uh, is it a vision of a utopia by any chance? The purpose of his life. Uh -huh. The meaning of his being. Yes. Now, when I say she lays it out, she literally unfurls oh. a quilt Whoa. into which is stitched a map. Oh. The why of his existence is inextricably stitched into the wear of the map. So he had to go to someone to hand him a map to his own destiny. Okay. A space. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this map, Mr. Citizen. You see that right there? Mm -hmm. That's a city. That's only a half mile by a half mile. But that's a city. Okay. It's made of bones, of pearly white bones. I've seen it. A city made of bones. I, th I think I think I've been there in a couple of video games. I've been there, Mister Citizen. My mother lived there. Mm. I got an aunt and three uncles lived down there in that city made of bones. Uh huh. You want to go there, Mister Citizen? I can take you there if you want to go. That's the center of the world. In time, it will all come to light. The people made a kingdom out of nothing. They were the people that didn't make it across the water. They sat down right there. They say, let's make a kingdom. Let's make a city of bones. That's kind of a sad notion. The people got a burning tongue, Mr. Citizen. Their mouths are on fire. Uh -huh. Saw. Okay. Well, the map we have today, uh -huh. it points us to Bronzeville. I, I, I got to give it to him. I mean, as far as like dramatic presentation and, uh, uh, and structure, yeah, this is probably one of the best TEDx's uh, overall. Um, as far as convincing me, uh, I mean, it's okay. Here's the thing. It's his project. He's arranging it. He's you know, spearheading it. He's part of the organization. More power to him. You know, go for it. Uh, I was a little put off by, you know, obviously the introduction, but he hasn't really dwelled on that too much since then. So maybe, I, I don't know. It, 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 it's awfully ambitious. I'm just wondering if maybe the reach exceeds the grasp on this one. Not, not out of, I hope it fails or something, but just sort of being uh, a little bit, I don't know, maybe overly realistic or 
maybe a little bit cynical. We can take you there if you want to go. Uh huh. And like the bones of St. Peter at the Vatican, uh huh, or the ones that create the city of bones in Aunt Esther's depiction, the citizens of Bronzeville can knit the bones of our ancestors together to create a kingdom too. Okay. A kingdom where on any night that you make the pilgrimage, uh huh, the people spit fire. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I, I mean, uh, 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 not hmm. very dramatic. Not a lot, actually, underneath. I, I didn't hear much of a, uh, not quite sure. Did I hear an argument? I guess we'll go over that in a moment. Uh, thank you, Frosted Glass. This guy takes forty-five minutes to order a Big Mac. <sighs> yeah, a, yeah a, a, a lot of words. I don't know. Does that become word salad? I just, I guess it does. It becomes a very pretty word salad, but we'll get to it in a moment. Let's, uh, let's get to the bingo card. So that was the presentation. Let's get into the critical analysis, right? That's what we do here. We uh, apply our critical thinking skills to the subject matter that we just heard. Let me update the card real quick. Uh, I think it might be an uphill battle to get a bingo on this one, but we'll see. Uh, real quick, Keeverdam, thank you so much again. City of Bones is that like the Isle of Dogs? Isn't there a City of Bones? Sounds like the name of a movie or a book uh, that I I know I've seen somewhere. Isn't there? Isn't there a, a book or a movie called City of Bones, or you know, one inspired by the other? Feels like there should be. Thank you, Keeverdam. Is like the Isle. Of, I, I don't know. I don't. Know. Is there a City of Bones? When I think of like a city of bones, I think of like the uh, the uh, tunnels underneath Paris or something, right? The the catacombs with all those skulls and bones and everything lining up all the walls and that kind of deal. That kind of all right. Anyway, uh, so let's go over the bingo card: systemic or institutional? Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. well, he talked about various things: the Capitol building, uh, the uh, uh, Vatican City churches in general, uh, other places. So institutions in so far as being represented by buildings and such. I think that's, I think that's fair. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Not, not really. He focused in on black performers at the beginning and then kind of trailed off and didn't really talk about anyone else. So uh, maybe not. Plays victim. No, not not in any specific sense. Microaggressions or unconscious bias. Um, he didn't use the term, so I'm having a hard time thinking of a uh, anything that lined up with it. Uh, privilege. Uh, well, he brought up re well. That's more yeah. I'll get to economic disparity. Uh, maybe. Maybe contradicts own point or argument. Well, there really, really wasn't an argument. It was a sales pitch, right? It was, uh, I'm planning on building this thing because this thing is going to represent this thing, just like these other places represent this kind of thing. And that's why I'm doing it. I'm making a place to embody, to house, to represent a specific idea or cultural significance, just like the Capitol building, just like the Basilica, just like Temple Mount and on these kind of things. Like, okay, you're trying to make that kind of thing for your, you know, uh, passion. There really wasn't an argument there. It was more of a declaration, I suppose. Um, but of course, if one of you has something uh, to say otherwise, let me know. Patriarchy, no. Weightless example. Ah... Uh... Again, he brought up meaningful spaces and places and buildings and such to underline his point of the importance or the significance of having a place that represents a cultural ideal or idea. I, I can't think of a weightless example in that regard. Economic disparity. He talked about redlining. He talked about Bronzeville or the Black Belt, uh, that kind of thing. So that was part of uh, the presentation. Feminism. Not specifically. Uh, I mean, he did mention the character in the play was a matriarch, but simply being a matriarch of a family does not necessarily mean feminism writ large. Uh, marginalized marginalization. Uh, yeah, he talked about redlining again with Bronzeville um, and 
uh, the history thereof. So sure. A list. Um, I know we didn't see like a numbered list and everything, but he went down phase one, phase two. We're going to add this. We're going to have this hotel, restaurant, costume shop. So there was a list of goals in there. Uh, white supremacy. Uh Obviously implied also, if not for anything else, than at the beginning where he said forced labor, which is alluding to slavery. Uh, so, you know, there's obviously some white supremacy involved in there. Word salad. I am going to circle word salad because even though, uh, you know, I understood what he was saying and his, uh, you know, word choice and vocabulary were par excellence, it was all a bunch of words not really saying anything. So, yeah. Uh, Self-vilification or wretchedness? No. Argumentative non sequitur? As, as well of a recital as it was, breaking out into a bit from a play in the middle of everything felt more like filler uh, than on point with anything. And I, I wasn't quite sure... Well, I don't know. Is is that is an argument of non sequitur or weightless example? Hmm, that's a tough. I, yeah, what what does it fit better? You guys tell me. What, was the was the play portion a weightless example, or was it an argument of non sequitur? I'm I'm leaning towards non sequitur, but I I could be I could be uh, convinced otherwise. Mind reading assumes motives. Uh, he talked about historical uh, events. He talked about obviously you know significant. Uh, uh, geographical locations and buildings and things. I don't think he was reaching and saying that, you know, the Capitol building or St. Peter's Basilica or these things are meaningful to people. There's not really mind reading in there. Uh, benevolent condescension. Eh, I, I don't, don't think so. You tell me. Anecdote that probably never happened. Again, he cited uh, historical facts and locations and things and didn't really give an an And his anecdote about his childhood in and of itself didn't sound, uh, you know, too good to be true. It was just very common stuff, I suppose. Lastly, leaves out vital context. Um, I He brought it up and then he kind of went away. Is, is Where is the funding coming from? Uh, not that I don't believe there is any or something. It's just that I was just curious because he started like, you know, in these years that have gone by, I've worried about this, that, and the other. Like, well, who are your partners? Uh, who has been generous enough to donate? Who are you working with explicitly? You know, I just, that little part about the, uh, the, the how and how is all going to fit together. And, and, and again, the idea that maybe he's overreaching in his goals a little bit. How is that all supposed to work? Uh, all the various businesses and uh, industry that's going to take place in this uh, this location. How much and exactly how much land would be required to house all of this? I don't know much about Chicago. I don't know much at all about the neighborhood he's talking about. But uh, it sounds like a substantial amount of land will be required to facilitate these facilities. So anyway, that's the card as I have it. If you have arguments for squares to be circled, put them in the chat. Now, if you've already put it up there and I miss it, please just repost it. Uh, Frosted Glass, weightless example, City of Bones. I'm leaning on it. Any more thoughts on that? Uh, Yvonne Solomon. Oh, uh, not talking to me, but hi, Yvonne. And uh, some, some other hellos while I see people here. Resolute Germ, hello. Lexi Mads, hello. Anybody else in the meantime? Uh, well, if I, if I missed you, I hope to get to you. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, let's see. Uh, original stream left out the blues museum and many other historical sites dedicated to the black experience across the country. Yeah. That was the thing. It's like, uh, where is, where is the place that represents, uh, black performance arts? Right. And it's like, there's, I, like I, I came up with Alvin Ailey for, cause I, when I think of performance art, I usually think of like, you know, dancing, that kind of thing, dancing or, or stage plays, that kind of deal. And so I thought of Alvin Ailey, but yes, you know, jazz clubs, uh, Motown, uh, you've got, you've got a whole raft of places across the country that depending on what we're talking about can be seen as representing 
uh, black performance art. So to say there isn't any, or you can't think of one, I, 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 that seems a little bit disingenuous to me. Um, if you're trying to make one that encompasses all of it, well, I think people in different places and different states might say otherwise. But if he's talking about explicitly that which took place in Chicago, then maybe he's got a point. I don't know. Uh, and, and, maybe, and, and maybe I'm already uh, muddling the, the beginning of this. Was he talking about creating a place for Black performance art writ large? Or was he just talking about Chicago and the area surrounding it specifically? Because if he meant that, then that makes a bit more sense, I suppose. If, if he'd said it in a sense of like, there isn't any at all in the world, then, yeah. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Frost of Glass says, Scribe Light, the play excerpt is both weightless example and non sequitur. Mm, do I want to double dip? I think I will. And you know why? A, because I think it does fit. You know, that's why I was sitting on the fence about it, is it, it does make sense for both. And secondly, neither of those squares are bingo squares. So there's not, well, there's less of a, less of an argumentative burden. So let's take that one there. Uh, Lexi Mads, I immediately thought of the Apollo. Well, there, there, another one. Yeah, like I said, there's, there's plenty of places you could cite as centers of uh, black performance art, uh, either, either towns or institutions or whatever else. So, um, but again, if he's just meaning to build something to represent Chicago, then okay. Uh, Keldrick, thanks so much. If nothing else, his delivery was impressive. That's, that's the thing. And he has the advantage of decades of stage work and uh, television and movies and so on and so forth. So yes, the delivery was absolutely gorgeous. The overall content contained within, not that much. It was basically a elevator pitch stretched out into a 13-minute stage play after a fashion. Uh, Yvonne Solomon, Scarblet, I missed the bit at the beginning, so correct me if I'm wrong, but for Play's Victim, I got the gist that he needs a Black-focused theater district because of past racism. Um... <sighs> You see, when, when, it, when with a, the play's victim square is specifically when the speaker places themselves into a victim narrative of their own making or extrapolation, let's say, from events, you know, inserting themselves into some other thing or really playing up something for sympathy points or something. In his case, he he was talking about real history. Um. He was talking about trying to enshrine uh, the history of this town in a particular way. And that that's not really playing a victim, as far as, at least as far as I'm concerned, off the top of my head. Uh, so unless somebody else has an argument elsewise, I never really felt that he was making something up for victimhood points or something. That's, that's kind of what plays victim is meant to uh, embody. Uh, Frosted Glass, Benevolent Condescension. Why do black people need their own free special city to participate in the arts? Uh, well, it's not going to be free. <laughs> it, it certainly is not going to be free. Um, that, that, that's the one thing that hung me up on the deal is the implication at the beginning that this was only meant to showcase uh, upcoming performers based on their skin color rather than their talent and that they come from Chicago. I mean, you can have a museum memorializing and educating people on the history of that part of town and on the cultural um, origins of art forms in Chicago or from that part of the city and so on. But the idea that we're only going to showcase people who have a talent that as well fit that historical mold that's the part where it's kind of like, ah, that sends kind of the wrong message to me, but maybe that's just me. Um, as far as benevolent condescension, expand on that. I'm not saying no, but I just need a bit more than that because I didn't. I never really felt like I was being condescended to. So that's a, uh, 
That's an up, uphill battle, I think. Uh, Simon Willikins, for the reason the reason for his advantage as a presenter could also explain his bad opinion, double-edged sword much. Um, it's not a... I don't know that it was a bad opinion. I just don't know that the project, in the way that he described it, is feasible uh, both logistically and spatially. Uh, a performing arts center? Okay, Sure. A performing arts center with a built-in costume uh, manufacturer? Uh, okay. A performing arts center with a museum? Okay. A performing arts center with a restaurant and a hotel and a museum and a costume shop? And like, whoa, whoa. So, I mean, in the sense that he was, if he was making this as a sales pitch to investors... I would be a little hesitant to invest because it feels like, again, reach exceeding grass. But then I don't know exactly how far they've gotten. Uh, he's talked about, you know, we're in phase one, we're in phase two. He's showing us a CGI creation of the Performing Arts Center. So there's nothing physical yet to show, I suppose, at least at the time of this was recorded. Da fuk as ho. Uh, a sales pitch is an argument for something. Must make this for X group slash demographic. Contradiction, most everything he mentioned does not exclude X Catholic, Muslim, the capital, etc. cetera. Um, well, that is true. That is true. I mean, in the sense that uh, the, the religions don't exclude people. Well, now they don't. <laughs> I mean, the more modern versions of some of these religions, but of course, you know, depending on missionary work and so on. So yes, uh, the Capitol building, um, uh, St. Peter's Basilica, the, these things all represented ideas and ideologies that in their most modern and progressive forms, accept everybody, regardless of your uh, look, so long as you have faith and or you adhere to those uh, ideals or laws or whatever else. In this case, yes, he was pitching something for uh, a specific demographic that uh, only celebrated one, you know, one race effectively. So uh, is that a contradicts his own point or is, or, or did those just become weightless examples to his argument. Both. So, yes. I I agree. Yes, the examples that he used contradicted the meaning or the intention of what he was describing. Yeah. It it, it I mean, he, like I said, he trailed off from focusing on that for the latter, let's say, two-thirds of the talk. But it did feel at the beginning that this was meant to be a very exclusive and exclusionary endeavor. I hope that's not true. I hope that's not the ultimate result. But it sure sounded like it. So. Okay. Uh, Frost of Glass. He's being condescending to Black saying they need this ridiculous special treatment to have an impact on the arts. <sighs> Uh, well, there's also the, I mean, there's that, but again, like at the beginning, as we said, when he asked the, the grand question, okay, I might need to go back or I need somebody to clarify for me. When he posed the question to the audience, where is the performing arts center or where is the center of the universe for black performing arts? Was he talking about writ large or was he talking about Chicago? If he was talking about Chicago, Okay, if he was talking about in the world in general, that was ignoring and or dismissing a whole raft of different things. So that's that's the one part I, I'm, I'm I'm stuck on. I might have to. Oh boy, do I have to go back and listen to this again? Ha! <sighs> All right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to. Bring the video back up because that that is that is an important point that we need to have clarified because that really does 
speak to the heart of a lot of this. I, I don't usually do this. I don't usually bring up the video a second time after we've already played it. It has happened a couple of times in the past, but in this instance, I really want to make sure I know what he said. Uh, so I'm not uh, telling stories out of school, so to speak. All right, so let me do this one second. Apologies, it's going to uh, get goofy here for a second. Uh, this and this and this. Okay, are we all lined up again? We are lined up again. All right, we're going to try this again. Uh, sound is on, I hope. Yes, okay. Let's see. Results and can withstand the examination. The development of a designated space can absolutely change our neighborhoods and maybe even save lives. Okay. Well, the save lives part, I'm not quite sure. I mean, well, I mean, I suppose if you find a calling or a vocation that's outside of other things, it could. All right. Anyway. For achieving more humane out school. And like my brother, I served as an old walk through yes. the door, the Catholic yes. churches, they were all over the place. Yes. The word Catholic means universal in every yes. place the Catholic church lives, what it calls home base. Yes. You would most likely answer, it's built over the bones of St. Peter, center of Islam, and that you make the pilgrimage at least once in your lifetime. Notwithstanding, the very heart of the faith is the Kaaba, yeah. as a position in space around which there is a billion people in prayer and democracy itself. You this spring, my wife and I visited the National Theater in London. It's good. And Olivier. Okay. It is a, a crowning. Sorry for the jumping around. I I know, you know, sort of abstractly where the part is. I just got to find Achievement it. of architecture and theatrical content, but also a public space. Yes. Open internet access. Yeah, open internet access. That's always important. We can tell you that the home of William Shakespeare. Yeah, 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 yeah. What is the focal point of the outpourings of the heart? that live in our dance, our song. Wait, I think I just skipped over the first part of it. Sorry, one sec. That is where the culture of Shakespeare lives. But where does black performance culture live? Okay, not in Chicago, black performance culture. What is the focal point of the outpourings of the heart that live in our dance, our song, our, our passion, our wisdom? Not specifically in Chicago. Where is its home? What city? What's in the home? Who designed it? Where can we learn more about these things? Okay. Uh, all right. So he wasn't talking about specifically Chicago and its history and its culture. He was talking about writ large globally. All right. Let me uh, go back here. Starting over again, uh, there we go. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. Uh, boop, 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 and of course, okay, Frosted Glass. Whether it's Chicago or worldwide, he's being condescending to blacks. They already impact the arts. Yeah, well, this is what I'm. This is this is why I wanted to double check. If he's talking about globally and he's asking the rhetorical question, where is the center of this and that and the other? He's dismissing the work, the institutions, the locations, the buildings, and so on of dozens upon dozens of other places in the United States that represent either many aspects of or very specific, specific aspects of uh, Black performance culture. So that, that is benevolent condescension. That, that's why I wanted to double check. I just wanted to make sure, because if he was just talking about Chicago, if he's just talking about that, maybe there isn't. Maybe there isn't a place that enshrines that particular part of history and performance culture. And so that makes a bit more sense. But he's ignoring everything else and saying there's no such thing. And so I'm going to build that. That's, yeah. So there you go. That's that's why I wanted to make sure. That's why I wanted to make sure. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Any other arguments for squares to be circled? Because uh, we got that one. And no bingos. I mean, we're just on the edge. But I don't think we're going to get one. It's, it's one of those things. And uh, yeah, no WTF moments. Like I say, no, nothing was so outlandish that it made my brain break or anything. Um. Uh, 
Uh, Grand Inquisitor Tyr Alexander. As a member of Black Culture, he is a... Okay. Okay. Settle down, everybody. Good gravy. Okay. <laughs> Just settle down. We got it. We got it. Oh, boy. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. What, what Was he a bit... Uh, what do I want to say? Uh, in love with his own self on the idea of making a uh, St. Peter's Basilica, putting something on that score. I mean, maybe he will. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, original Stroom, this card needed presenter is a racist square. <laughs> well, I mean, we used to have that one, um, uh, b b the, the, the uh, predecessor to argumentative non sequitur. It makes something about race, sex, et cetera, for no reason. Yeah. Okay. Pr Prostate glass. Scribe light. Diversity and inclusion. Trying to get more black people in the arts. Oh. I mean, that was the intention, wasn't it? Yeah. I, hmm. Yeah. It's a bingo square. Oh, man. It's actually, it's a two bingo square. Ooh. Uh, let's see, Yvonne Solomon, scribe by another attempt to plays victim. Why does he feel the need for a mecca of black arts? Well, and, and why there isn't already something, again, like Lexi said, the Apollo, Motown. Uh, I mean, uh, there's there's so many theaters in Harlem, for crying out loud. If you want to talk about like American black culture, uh, there's plenty of places in the country that could be said. And like, like there's, there's jazz clubs down in uh, New Orleans and everything that that could cover that house of blues. I mean, yeah. Okay. Anyway, diversity, equity, and inclusion. He didn't say any of the words. I know, I know, I know. It's just, it's just too much of a stretch. It's too much of a stretch. It's too much of a stretch. You know I'm right. Well, I need a better argument than that. Because, he, again, I just need... And I, and I got to wrap this up pretty quick, too. I can't go on for too much longer. I don't want, I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome on this one. Uh, advocates Diably, personal opinion, Shakespearean del delivery does not work well for a TEDx. It all depends on the context. It all depends on the context. Um, like I say, it was, it was one of the most like entertaining insofar as just one. I, I liked listening to him talk. <laughs> I like Harry Lennox a lot as a performer, uh, and as a speaker. Uh, like I said, my first exposure to him was in, uh, in uh, Titus, Titus Andronicus with Anthony Hopkins back in the early 2000s or whatever. Um, and his appearance on the screen and his soliloquy uh, in that play is just amazing. It was like it was such a uh, uh, sort of a, a narrative transition. And when he comes up on the screen and he starts talking, I'm just like, I'm mesmerized. Absolutely mesmerized. Never forget that. First time I saw it. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, did you not see my previous post? I I obviously did not. You might have to repost it. Uh, Alexi Mads, he wants his center to be the equivalent of Lincoln Kennedy Center, hence equity. Oh, equality. Uh, <laughs> Equality of outcome. Okay, all right, all right. You know, death by a thousand cuts. I didn't want to just hand it over. It's a double bingo square, but you know what? All right. Le Lexi gave the straw. My camel's back has been broken. What do you know? What do we got? Well, we have a twofer. Oh, won't somebody please? Bingo. B-I-N-G-O. Okay. Right? Bingo. What? Of course. You guys broke me down. What can I tell you? All right. All right. I, I, hey, I can't make it easy. I can't just hand them out. I, I, I got to have that argument. I got to have a really good justification for it. 
especially when it comes down to bingo squares and double bingo squares in particular. Shadow Claw, Mortal Instruments, City of Bones. That's what it was. That's what it was. Thank you, Shadow Claw. Yes, I know I'd heard that phrase somewhere before. I'm assuming that that book and movie don't are, are not connected to the play he mentioned. I'm assuming. Uh, let's see. Grand Inquisitor, T.R. Alexander. Plays victim is the beginning. He has said that black people had to be more than human to survive something that normal humans would fold under. Oh, that's right. Oh. See, here, here, okay. I know you're gonna, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna hate me for it, but here's the thing. In the context he was talking about, he was talking about slavery. He's talking about abject under the law, racism, and oppression. Having having a certain amount of, of pride or amazement in your ancestors for enduring such a thing, I can't really fault him for that. I, can't, I, I really have a hard time faulting him for that. Just as I have a certain level of reverence and respect for my grandparents, just as an example, uh, who came from a generation that survived the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. You know, they had a ridiculous hardship dumped upon them against their own, you know, decision, will, anything. But they worked and they scraped and they scrapped to survive it, made it through, and here I am today. I have a hard time faulting anybody for having that amount of reverence, respect, or, you know, retroactive uh, pride uh, in people to survive that kind of hardship. That's, that's why. That's why. So that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying you couldn't make an argument for it. I don't think that's the one though. That doesn't really, that doesn't really click with me. Um, but no offense, no offense. Uh, but I'll, okay, we'll go on. Uh, slaves in America aren't the first people to go through slavery and maintain some sense of identity. <sighs> Yeah, but he's talking about people that actually went through it in this country in the context of America. He's talking about American history. He's talking about history of Chicago, so on and so forth. He's talking about a very specific uh, slice of history. And it's not irrelevant to his argument, to his, you know, sense of passion for pushing this project forward. It's not playing a victim. He, the, the, here, here's... Here's where the line would have been crossed, as far as I'm concerned. If he had directly, directly associated himself with that history, rather than being someone who's trying to memorialize and enshrine that struggle, that's that's where the line would have been crossed in my mind. He didn't do that, though. He has to, be, he has to make it himself centered in some way as a victim. Okay, talking about people that were victimized, talking about things that actually happened, but not making himself that, you know, connected avatar to it. I mean, for whatever else you want to say about it, he's attempting to create something that is meant to, as, as with the museum, to memorialize, to educate, and so on. So his motives in that regard aren't a victimhood narrative. Okay, that's... I know, I know, I'm upsetting some people right now, but I'm I'm trying to pl play honest here. He he didn't talk about himself so much. He talked about his history of going to church and all that other kind of stuff. But as far as he himself making himself part of that narrative, rather than a speaker for the dead, so to speak, uh, which if you get that reference, good for you, sci-fi nerd. But uh, yeah, so that's that's my only pushback. Again. Feel free to disagree with me and just you know uh, lay into me in the comments on it. I don't think that crosses the line uh, with what he was saying. Okay, I know this has been a this has been a rough one. This has been a rough one for trying to figure it out because there wasn't a whole lot of an argument there, but there was a lot of questionable things in motivation, intent, and possibility of success here. But uh, I think I think that's about as far. Okay, this every everybody's really on me for this one. <laughs> everybody's really on me for this one. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, every race 
has been enslaved throughout history. Africa still has legal slavery. Yes, I understand that. He mentioned American slavery, a thing that happened, a thing that is undeniable. And I don't find anything wrong inherently with trying to memorialize it, you know, or, or talk about real history that happened. It depends on how you're doing it. And in his case, simply having a museum talking about the history of that part of town as relates to African-Americans, that's fine. Having a performance art center that is meant to further those same arts and styles and culture that grew out of that part of town over history, that's fine. Making it racially exclusive, as was implied heavily at the beginning, that's not really that great. <laughs> to put it mildly. But again, playing a victim, I, I don't think he did. I don't think he did. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there. I know. I, okay. One, one more, one more try here. Yvonne Salman. So he would have had to say something along the lines of people like me or the community I come from needs this or something. It would have had to have been something like uh, just like my ancestors, I have faced those same challenges, something like that. He would have had to directly associate himself uh, as, as equating himself to the people victimized by slavery in the past. Something very explicit, something very self-centered. I never got that from this. I never got that from this. That That is, I, I know it's a tenuous line. I know uh, invoking slavery oftentimes is a very easy card to play for sympathy and so on. But him playing the victim simply by bringing up slavery, again, you, you could say that it's a weightless example, right? You, you could say that it was an argumentative non sequitur. He brings it up, but doesn't bring it up again, so on. Those are fine. But a plays victim situation is he has to center himself in a way that uh, either uh, overstates or uh, hyperbolizes. Is that a word? I hope it is. Hyperbolizes his own experience with something to make it bigger than it actually is. That's... That's what it is. That's my argument. Again, if you disagree, perfectly fine. L leave a dislike, leave a comment. I, that's fine. This is for discussion. And I'm happy to hear everybody else's arguments. And I have, for whatever it's worth, awarded uh, post-show squares before. So if somebody does lay out a really compelling argument based on what he said and how he said it in the talk after the fact, I will post-show give that square and put a big bingo uh, announcement in that thing. And I'll pin it. If they, if somebody comes up with an argument that convinces me to circle plays victim after the fact, put in the comments. If it convinces me, I will pin it. I'll put a big bingo on there and you'll be the hero of the day for getting a third bingo. But with that, everybody, I've gone on far too long that I meant to all things considered in proportion to usual shows. Uh, a couple of programming notes. First and foremost, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern will be the Sunday stream where I'll go over a thing. I'm not sure yet what it'll be. I'll decide probably on Saturday. Uh, secondly, I posted a new video today. Yes, an actual video, an edited, not necessarily scripted, save for the fact that I read an article, but a video, not a live stream on my channel. Uh, there was a little piece of news that came out uh, yesterday or the day before uh, that uh, made me kind of happy and gave me hope for the future, but also generated a whole bunch of other questions. I'm not going to tell you what it all is because I want you to go watch, but if you want to go take a look at that, please do. It's over on my channel. Also, I have a Discord. Discord link is in the description. Sorry, in the description, in the chat right now. If you'd like to join the Discord, all you have to do is click on that link. You'll find yourself on the landing channel called Say Hello. And there, all you have to do is say the secret word and you will find yourself a member of the Discord because we'll know you watch the stream. And today's secret word is uh, friendly disagreement. Secret phrase, friendly disagreement. There you go. 
If you say hello and friendly disagreement, we'll know that you watched the show. Also, I forgot, almost forgot. Also on Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, will be the next episode of Book Review of the Vampire, wherein my friend Leonora and I are reading The Vampire Lestat and talking about it as we go. Currently, we are reading the section in the book called The Children of Darkness. So if you'd like to follow along, read the section called The Children of Darkness. That's what we'll be talking about on Sunday. Um, and otherwise, yeah, that's the show. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Also, if you can't already tell, thank you, thank you so much for your participation and argumentation. Whether I agree with you or not, ultimately, that is part of the process here, is to really listen to what someone says, break it down and see, does it convince us? Does it make sense? Does it fit with the bingo card? That's the whole part of this that I enjoy the most. And I appreciate you guys uh, helping out with that, especially for anybody else listening in the future that wants to argue along as well. Uh, moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things, even though everyone here is so well behaved, even in disagreement, that you have very little to do. And everybody who donated, either to myself or to the fundraisers pinned to the top of the chat box, thank you guys so much for your generosity. Really do appreciate it. A couple more hellos before I go. Roan Harushin, Alyssa doesn't lie. Did I miss somebody else? I'm sure I did. Uh, didn't I see someone else up here earlier that I meant to say hello to that I didn't? I probably did. If I didn't, I apologize. Uh, okay, well, either way, whoever you are that I recognized, at least momentarily in the chat that I didn't say hello to, hi, and everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your Thursday. I hope you have a good Friday ahead of you and weekend as well. I uh, hope wherever you are, you are safe and warm or nice and cool, depending on your circumstances. And I hope you are all as well, safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon, and I will see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>